Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming back for our final session of today. We had a, a rumbustious panel uh, just before this, and uh, I can promise a very exciting panel to end off today. My name is Fiona Harvey. I am the environment editor of The Guardian newspaper, and I'm here to moderate this panel this afternoon on understanding the biophysical limits to growth, to build an economy that respects planetary boundaries. Uh, just to give you a few words uh, to begin with on some, uh, some stuff you may have heard before, but I'm just going to repeat it for you. If you require textual interpretation, there's a speech-to-text tool for each of the uh, plenaries. It's in 23 languages. It's on the website. Interpretation, English, French, German, is available on the headsets in your seats. And whether you're in the room or following the conference online, you can participate in the Q&A after our panelists have spoken by going to the Slido link or by scanning the QR code at each entrance. It's shown on the slideshows and it's also on the conference website. So do please participate. Uh, we want to hear your questions uh, or comments when we've heard from our panelists. So we're talking about uh, the, the limits to growth, biophysical limits to growth, because the economy uh, and growth, these are human constructs. Uh, but what aren't human constructs, of course, are the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. And that's what we're coming up against. We're coming up against real planetary limits in our extraction and use of resources. Um, if you look at what's happening in the oceans uh, at the moment, uh, they're incredibly hot. It's off the scale, uh, according to, to scientists. Um, we've seen unprecedented uh, heating in the oceans. What some people fear, what some scientists fear, is that the oceans are losing their capacity to uh, absorb uh, all of the heat that we're pouring into the atmosphere. If you look at the Amazon, Many scientists are afraid that what's happening there as a result of global heating uh, caused by us and as a result of deforestation caused by us, uh, that we're seeing the, the Amazon approach a tipping point where it could stop being reinforced, start being savanna. Everywhere around the planet, in our oceans, uh, in our forests, uh, in our biodiversity hotspots, we are seeing the limits uh, of what we can do as a species, and we cannot go beyond those limits without doing ourselves irreparable harm. So that's what we're here to talk about today, and I'd just like to remind our panellists, each of whom are going to speak, we've got some who are joining us remotely, some who are here in person, uh, that limits are real uh, and you must keep to time. Uh, you've got ten minutes each to speak. Uh, we don't want anyone here uh, overstepping that limit. We're going to hear, first of all, uh, from uh, the European Commission, uh, from Valdis Dombrovskis, the Executive Vice President uh, of the Commission, who's given us a recorded message. Uh, then I'll introduce each of our other panellists, and then after that, you'll have the chance to ask questions. Okay, thank you. Here's the Commission. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the European Parliament's Beyond Growth Conference. The EU is firmly committed to becoming the first climate-neutral continent by 2050. This ambition is enshrined in the European Green Deal. It aims to transform the EU into a resource-efficient and more competitive green economy. Uh, this spans a wide range of policy areas, including energy, agriculture, transport and taxation, to mention just a few. The process of decoupling economic growth from carbon emissions is ongoing. Since 1990, EU GDP grew by about 50%, while carbon emissions fell by more than 25%. Uh, but now we really need to turbocharge our efforts. The additional private and public investment needed for the green transition is estimated at nearly 520 billion euros per year until 2030. To achieve the Green Deal goals, the Commission has pledged to mobilize at least 1 trillion euros in sustainable investments over this decade. The current EU budget notably has a climate spending target of 30%. In the Recovery and Resilience Facility, EU countries must dedicate at least 37% of financing to support climate objectives. 
They are now encouraged to add specific repower EU chapters to their plans, focusing on renewables and energy savings. All reforms and investments financed by the Recovery and Resilience Facility must respect the do no significant harm principle for the environment. Also, our recent proposals to reform EU fiscal rules recognize the need to achieve fair, green and digital transitions. They aim to ensure public debt sustainability through realistic fiscal adjustment while facilitating investments and reforms to boost our prosperity. In particular, they allow member states to extend their medium-term fiscal adjustment paths with appropriate reforms and investments. Here, the Green Deal is of paramount importance. This includes member states' own work to achieve climate neutrality via national energy and climate plans. National budgets are also important for the green transition. Member states must redirect public revenue and expenditure towards green priorities and away from harmful subsidies. This is reflected in the Economic Governance Review. It encourages member states to publish information on how relevant tax and revenue items help meet climate and environmental goals. The Commission has been working with the OECD and member states on developing green budgeting practices since 2019, and this work is continuing. We know that climate-related shocks affect fiscal planning. Therefore, the review also requires member states to assess implications of climate change and climate-related policies on public finances. I will now turn to private investment. While public finance needs to lead the way, the private sector needs to provide the scale. We need to attract capital from across the board to reach our climate neutral goals. Investing in economic activities that mitigate climate change and generate economic growth can make a crucial difference. Capital markets are essential for helping money flow towards sustainable companies and projects. We have made it easier for investors to do this with the EU taxonomy classification system. And we continue to develop it. The Commission will soon propose criteria for water, circular economy, pollution and biodiversity. Better corporate information is also essential so that financial market participants disclose their sustainable investment to their clients. The Commission will soon propose the first set of corporate sustainability reporting standards and present a legislative proposal for environmental, social and governance ratings. This helps us to establish standards and labels for sustainable investment products. For example, we have the recent political agreement on the European Green Bond Regulation. Lastly, we have enhanced the role played by green policies in the European semester. Environmental sustainability is now a core element as part of the analysis of key uh, socio-economic challenges in each member state. This role will continue guiding member states' policies through country-specific recommendations. To conclude, the European Union has set out a clear way forward for fair and sustainable economic growth. Uh, it addresses climate change and respects planetary boundaries. It is now the responsibility of us all to put this into effect. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Vice President of the Commission there. Uh, that was very useful. I'm sure you'll agree to hear. Um, and we will move on now to uh, Professor Johan Rockström, who's joining us remotely. Professor Rockström, of course, from the Potsdam Institute in Germany, uh, which is a world-renowned centre of climate research. Uh, do we have him? There we go. You've got 10 minutes, Johan. Take it away. Thanks, uh, thanks, Fiona, and uh, a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay, and I should have some slides coming up, which I do not see myself at the moment, but uh, there we are. I see them in the in the far back. Uh, it would be good if I could see them myself as well, but uh, let's see how we can... We can oh, see you. Yeah, there we are. Thanks. So click, click the next, please. 
So I would argue that scientifically, the three most important insights that changes the entire economic growth paradigm for humanity's future on Earth is the insight that we now enter the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch where we are the dominating force of change on planet Earth, that the Holocene, the last 12,000 years, is the only state we know for certain can support civilizations as we know it, and that tipping points are not only real, they're coming closer and they can cause abrupt, irreversible changes of life support systems on Earth. This is what leads to the conclusion that we need new growth paradigms, a development within planetary boundaries. That's our chance to the future for humanity on Earth. If you take the next, please. The Anthropocene today is not only a geological epoch we entered in the mid-1950s when we embarked on the Great Acceleration, which is actually where economic growth only worked because of, or thanks to, the subsidies of eroding life support systems on Earth, causing the hockey stick patterns of rising pressures. We are now no longer in the Anthropocene, we're deep into the Anthropocene. We are starting to hit the ceiling of biophysical processes that regulates the functioning, stability, and resilience of the entire Earth system. If you take the next, this manifests itself today in four crises. If you click again, the first one, of course, the climate crisis, but we're also deep into an ecological crisis. We are hopefully the tail end of a global pandemic, which is in itself a reflection of unsustainable exploitation of natural habitats. It's a zoonosis, a virus spillover from wildlife to humans. And we're also in a geopolitical crisis of instability and a gap or incredible loss of trust between countries in the world. This is the turbulent manifestation of the Anthropocene. And in all this, we have a collision with the stability of, to start with, the atmosphere. If you take the next, the IPCC 6 assessment concludes, if you just click once again, to give you the highlights of the summary report of the AR6, the 6 assessment report, is, in my mind, a breakthrough step forward. Not only does it conclude that we unequivocally are in the midst of this climate crisis in terms of all the extreme impacts we are um, feeling already today, we're also threatening the stability of the planet. The health of the planet is at risk. And if you see the furthest down here is the conclusion that it won't be enough to now only phase out fossil fuels and reach a net zero world economy. We also need to maintain the resilience in the natural biosphere by keeping at least 30 to 50 percent of intact nature able to continue to provide resilience. This is a recognition of planetary boundaries also in the climate science. If you take the next, the drama is increased by the fact that not only are we posing all this pressure, we're actually leaving the Holocene at 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming, where we are right now, a point that reaches to touch 1.5 degrees Celsius already next year, when we are to a 66% chance uh, approaching a, a severe El Nino year with very high uh, likelihoods of record heat temperatures. But if you take the next, just look at the remarkable stability of the Holocene. This is when we leave the last ice age 16,000 years ago. We're hunters and gatherers with a few million people on Earth. And we enter the extraordinarily stable interglacial Holocene of 14 degrees Celsius world plus minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. And off we go into the civilizational journey as we know it today. So not only are we threatening the stability on Earth, we have a reference point for a desired planet. If you take the next, this is therefore um, the, the challenge of recognizing what is it that keeps the planet in this stable state. Well, it's not only orbital forcing uh, of changes in terms of solar radiation on the planet from the sun, it's also the internal biogeophysical processes that regulate the buffering capacity of the Earth system. And we have proof of this. If you take the next, from the Global Carbon Project, we have the hockey stick assessment every year of the global carbon cycle. You see the emissions above the zero line, but we also have this remarkable subsidy of the ocean in dark, uh, in light green and on land in dark green, which is the 50% uptake of carbon naturally on a healthy biosphere. This is when we can keep the system within planetary boundaries. The system, the Earth system, buffers stress and change. The ocean, the graph to the right, takes up 91% of the heat caused by our fossil fuel burning. 
This is a manifestation of a planet under stress responding in a healthy way by dampening the stress. We're unfortunate to see cracks in this ability. Just as Fiona referred to in the beginning, we're starting to see that, for example, the Amazon rainforest is shifting from sink to source, the world's largest terrestrial biome on Earth. We're seeing signs of rapid ice melt, abrupt thawing of permafrost, changes in ocean heat circulation, signs of losing this capacity of keeping the planet stable. This is particularly uh, a worry because all IPCC scenarios that gives us a global carbon budget for delivery on the Paris Agreement assume that the planet will remain stable and that there are no tipping points. The problem is, if you take the next, that science shows that tipping points are real and coming closer. We've mapped this, if you take the next, the 16 large climate tipping element systems that biophysically, scientifically have evidence of contributing to regulate the stability of the climate system and that they have multiple stable states. They have tipping points. Push them too far and they can cross this tipping point. The breakthrough here are the color schemes you see. This is for the first time we're able to assess at what temperature ranges the systems are at risk of crossing their tipping points. And if you take the next and click one more time, please. Here you have the 1.5 degrees Celsius line with the red embers confidence levels in science for all these 16 on the x-axis. And the 1.5 degrees Celsius line shows that four big tipping element systems, the ones furthest to the left, are likely to cross their tipping points already at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we're talking about the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet, all the tropical coral reef systems, and abrupt thawing of boreal permafrost. Just the two ice sheets host more than 10 meter sea level rise in the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet. It would not melt overnight, of course, but it would be irreversible, even if it took another thousand years. This is why we have so strong scientific evidence today for defending and holding on to the 1.5 degrees Celsius planetary boundary. And you may ask yourself, are these a few research groups at the frontier of science pointing this out? Well, yes, it's published in science recently by one research group, but it's now increasingly part of the consensus across the entire science community, if you take the next, because here you have the equivalent red embers diagram assessment in the IPCC. And just click again and you'll find the black box in the furthest right, which is what has happened on the scientific confidence on the risks of crossing tipping points from the fifth assessment in the left uh, column and the sixth assessment in the right column. And you see the black arrow showing that the more the science advances, the more evidence we have of the fragility of the Earth system with temperatures of risk going down, and now they are in the range of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius for irreversible abrupt events. So if you take the next, there's no doubt in my mind we need to become stewards of the entire planet because in a climate crisis you need to keep the resilience of the Earth system intact. That's why we need, if you take the next, planetary boundaries. The heuristic equation is you're welcome to the Anthropocene. We're posing pressures at the planetary level. We know the reference of a desired planet to measure against as our benchmark, and tipping points are hardwired and real. And these planetary boundaries have now been researched. If you take the next, for the past 15 years, we've identified nine biophysical systems that we have scientific evidence that they contribute to regulate the stability and resilience of the Earth system. And these are now, I would argue, scientifically uh, well established. The challenge is to quantify the safe boundaries and assess the degree of transgression and to understand the consequences. Now I'll show you work in progress. And if you take the next, this is our 2009 first planetary boundary publication. We were not able to quantify all the nine, only six of the nine. Three of the nine were assessed to be outside of the safe space. So it was biodiversity, climate change, and overloading of nitrogen. In 2015, if you take the next, we concluded that four of the nine were outside of the boundary, and those that were in the red were deeper in the red. We're still moving in the wrong direction, still not able to quantify all the nine. If you take the next, this is the ongoing 2023 review, in review, 
research where we are able for the first time to quantify all the nine and unfortunately the conclusion is that six of the nine are outside of the safe space. We're continuing to move in the wrong direction and this is the big concern. We need to rapidly transform. If you take the next we're also applying this in different systems. This is the food system assessment showing that the food system alone is, re is responsible for a large part of the transgression of planetary boundaries. And if you take the next, just to close on the journey we therefore have, it's not enough to just phase out fossil fuels in grey to a net zero world economy. We also need, even for a safe climate landing, to come within planetary boundaries, transforming the food system from source to sinks, shown in brown to orange, but also keeping in green and blue the planetary boundaries in the living biosphere intact on natural ecosystems on land and in ocean. This is the only chance for us to, to hold on to 1.5. If you take the next, we have, in just a few weeks' time, the Earth Commission will be producing an update on this consensus assessment, but also adding not only safety, but also justice. And um, keep an eye on this when, when it uh, gets published just in a few weeks' time in Nature. And final slide in the next. So for this discussion on going beyond growth, I think our, our kind of mental image must be to put human well-being, prosperity and equity here, the Sustainable Development Goals, within the safe operating space of a stable and resilient planet. That that is a new charge for us to have a chance to navigate a future in the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very, very clear presentation there. I'm going to invite Dan O'Neill now to talk to us. Uh, Dan is Professor at the University of Leeds and President of the European Society for Ecological Economics. And he's going to talk to us about macroeconomics, well-being and planetary boundaries. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you to the organizers of this, this amazing event. Um, in fact, could we have a round of applause for Leia and Francois, who've been working tirelessly behind the scenes? So before I start, I just want to address one elephant which seems reluctant to, to uh, leave the room. Uh, you could call this a, a housekeeping issue. In the conclusion to his message, Executive Vice President Dombrovsky said, and I quote, the European Union has set out a clear way forward for fair and sustainable economic growth, sustainable economic growth, that addresses climate change and respects planetary boundaries. <laughs> Let me be clear, it is not possible to achieve sustainable economic growth on a finite planet. <laughs> and certainly not within planetary boundaries. And Professor Rockstrom has given us a great overview of planetary boundaries, of the biophysical limits that the economies must ultimately live within. And what I would like to discuss with you now is the social implications of living within planetary boundaries and the economics needed to make this happen. A good starting point is the donut, developed by Kate Rayworth, who of course spoke yesterday. The donut combines the idea of planetary boundaries with the complementary idea of social boundaries. It visualizes sustainability as a donut-shaped space where resource use is high enough to meet people's basic needs, this is the social foundation, but not so high that we go crashing through the ecological ceiling of planetary boundaries. One of the things that my colleagues and I have done is to measure where different countries are in relation to this safe and just space. Here are the results for the European Union. Now, I know these slides are a little hard to see, so let me try to walk you through this. We'll start at the center. The blue wedges show social performance in relation to thresholds for meeting basic human needs. 
The green wedges show resource use relative to planetary boundaries. We want the blue wedges to reach the social foundation, and we want the green wedges to remain below the ecological ceiling. Anything in red is bad. It's either social shortfall or ecological overshoot. And what you quickly see is that the European Union does quite well on the social indicators, but it does so by transgressing all six of the ecological boundaries that we were able to measure. We might contrast this with a country like Kenya, which is within the safe space for all of the ecological boundaries, but it doesn't achieve any of the social indicators associated with meeting basic human needs. Now, if we look at a large number of countries together, what we quickly see is that countries that do well on the social indicators are using resources at an unsustainable level. So this figure shows the number of social thresholds that each country has achieved in comparison to the number of ecological boundaries that it has transgressed. And you can see the members of the European Union, I've highlighted in red, they're a little hard to see, but they're all pretty much in the top right-hand corner. Now the problem is that where we want to be, where we need to be, is in the top left-hand corner where no country currently is. Where this really starts to get interesting, though, is if we start to compare the individual ecological and social indicators. So these data show healthy life expectancy in comparison to CO2 emissions. But I could have picked pretty much any of the indicator pairs. Almost all of the plots show a relationship with diminishing returns. So at low levels of resource use, a small increase improves human well-being quite dramatically. But beyond some turning point, you get very little additional benefit. And what this suggests is that wealthy countries could dramatically reduce their resource use, moving to the left in this diagram without hurting human well-being. Now the problem is that European countries are actually moving to the right in this diagram. Over the past two decades, we have used more resources, not less. And despite the message from Executive Vice President Dombrovskis at the beginning of this session, we have not managed to decouple economic activity from its environmental impacts. In fact, our modeling work suggests that if we continue with current trends, by 2050, as you can see, we'll be even further beyond planetary boundaries. And the reason for this is quite simple. It is our continued pursuit of economic growth. <laughs> we shouldn't be cheering the continued pursuit of economic growth. <laughs> as Albert Einstein once said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created those problems. But as you all know, we have alternatives. We've been discussing them for the past two days. We have ideas like a post-growth or steady state economy. Now, Herman Daly did a lot to develop the idea of a steady state economy in the 1970s, including his book, Steady State Economics. And in the mid uh, 1990s, he published another book called Beyond Growth, The Economics of Sustainable Development. And sadly, Herman passed away last year, but if he were alive today, I think he would be quite happy that we are having a conference named Beyond Growth, named after his book here in the European Parliament. <laughs> Now, my own more modest contribution is a book and short film called Enough is Enough, which discusses some of the changes necessary to achieve a steady state economy. At its simplest, this is an economy where resource use is stabilized and kept within ecological limits. It's an economy where we replace the goal of improving, or rather increasing GDP, with the goal of improving human well-being. Now, as Tim explained this morning, if resource use is beyond ecological limits, if, beyond, if it's beyond planetary boundaries, then we need a process of degrowth in order to achieve a steady state economy. Degrowth means reducing resource use, but doing so in a way that protects social outcomes and enables and creates a more equitable society. Degrowth in wealthy nations would free up ecological space so that countries in the global south could increase their resource use and get people out of poverty. Okay, so this all sounds great, but can we really do this? What do you guys think? Yes. One of the first people to really try to explore this was the Canadian economist Peter Victor. 
He developed a computer simulation model for the Canadian economy to explore various low growth scenarios. And since this time, a number of other computer models have been developed to explore the policy changes needed to achieve a post-growth economy. I clearly don't have time to go through all of these changes, but let me give you three examples of the changes that are needed. The first is to limit inequality. Growth is often used as an excuse to avoid dealing with inequality. We're told that a rising tide lifts all boats, at least if you happen to have a boat like this one. Um, as an aside, this is Eclipse, one of the world's largest super yachts. It has two swimming pools, two helicopter pads, a submarine, and its own missile defense system. So, you know, the basics. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Wallach, who is a former governor of the Federal Reserve in the U.S., he once said that growth is a substitute for equality of income. So long as there is growth, there is hope, and that makes large income differentials tolerable. Well, hold on a second here. If growth is a substitute for equality, then greater equality is also a substitute for growth and a much better choice for the environment and for society. In a steady state economy, we could limit inequality by having a minimum and a maximum income. By a minimum income, I don't mean some low hourly wage that's conditional on working at McDonald's. I mean a universal basic income that every person is entitled to, regardless of whether they're working or not. And this could become increasingly important if digitalization and artificial intelligence replace much of the work in society that needs to be done. Another alternative that we've heard about in this conference would be to have universal basic services. The ideas are the same. We need to provide a social foundation that ensures that everyone's basic needs are met. Now, a maximum income might be more controversial, particularly if your last name is Bezos and your first name is Jeff. Um, <laughs> but it's just as important. Societies with more inequality tend to have more health and social problems, including more crime, more mental illness, and lower life expectancies. We need to ensure that the gap between the rich and the poor is not too great. And we can only do this by having an economic ceiling in addition to the social foundation. The second thing we need to do, and this is my personal favorite, at least in theory, is to reduce working hours. <laughs> At the moment, we largely use the benefits of technological progress to produce and consume more stuff. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say I work in a factory, and it takes me eight hours to produce one of these cups. One day, though, <laughs> let's say I come up with a clever idea, and I figure out how to make these cups twice as quickly. Does that mean I get to go home at noon? Well, no. It means I produce twice as many cups. And then our marketing department has to go out and try to convince people to buy these extra cups with witty slogans like, one cup is not enough, otherwise I'm out of a job. But we can't keep ramping up production just to keep people employed. Remember the planetary boundaries. What we can do, though, is use the benefits of technological progress to shorten the working day, week, and year. We can have the same salaries but more leisure time, which certainly sounds good to me. The third and final thing is we need to change the way we measure progress. At present, we rely on GDP, which we all know is a poor measure of progress because it doesn't distinguish between good and bad economic activity. If the police came to your door and said that activity in your neighborhood had gone up by 3% last year, you'd want to know what kind of activity. Was it more children playing in parks or more break and enters? Clearly, there's a difference. In a steady state economy, we should replace GDP with two sets of accounts. Measures of human well-being, such as health, happiness, employment, equality. These are the things we want to increase. And measures of resource use, such as material footprint, CO2 emissions, water use. These are the things we want to reduce and keep within planetary boundaries. Now, notice I said we should replace GDP, not complement it with additional indicators. I can see you're on board. Uh, the problem is not 
a lack of good indicators. The problem is that they're not being used in decision making because they're still trumped by GDP. We need to transform legislation such as the European Stability and Growth Pact, which still gives a lot of power to GDP, into a sustainability and well-being pact which would set enforceable environmental and social targets. And let me just say that a steady state economy is not an economy where the goal is zero growth in GDP. It is an economy where what happens to GDP no longer matters. So, will any of these changes ever happen? Well, I'm an economist, not a politician. But it's always been my hope that by showing that a steady state economy is economically possible, that it will become more politically realizable. At the moment, we're making decisions based on whether they're good for growth or good for productivity, not whether they're good for people or the planet. We have forgotten that growth is just one means to an end, not an end in itself. But once we let go of our obsession with GDP, we can focus on what really matters, the health of our societies and the ecosystems that contain them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. Thank you. That was great. And we can all reduce our working hours as well. That would be very helpful. Um, I'm going to turn now to Julia Steinberger, uh, who's a Professor of Ecological Economics at the University of Lausanne, who's going to talk to us about some of the policy and political aspects uh, of this issue. Come on then. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Fiona. Um, thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I have a few things I want to get through in my talk, um, but I also have a few things to just say from being on the second day of the conference. Um, one of the things that struck me is that whenever we hear the policymakers speak, we hear about progress, and we hear about um, the fact that they think they're doing good work, and I, I'm sure they are within the current setting. And when we hear the scientists speak, like Johan Rockström just did, like Yamina Saheb did this morning, we hear a sense of real urgency and danger. And I think that the gap between these two levels of speech should be concerning to us. Um, if we go back... <laughs> if we go back to Greta Thunberg's analogy of our houses on fire, it seems to me like a lot of the policymakers we're hearing speak now are sort of patting themselves a bit on the back for acknowledging that we have a house. <laughs> Which, it's, it's just not good enough. Okay, um, on to the talk. Um, so uh, I want to talk a bit about democratic provisioning and uh, what I think are some good ideas for sort of how we would move forward a lot faster and a lot differently uh, beyond growth. Um, so, and I realize, again, that nobody can see the slides. I'm sorry, I'm an academic, I need them. Um, so the, 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 the key idea here is that from research that we've been doing uh, at the University of Leeds, now the University of Lausanne, for the past, you know, five, six years, um, there's, uh, we're really seeing provisioning systems emerge as the key linchpin between resource use and planetary boundaries and well-being and social performance on the other. So we really need to look at the, what this object of provisioning systems is and study it and change it um, in, terms, in, in order to, to move forward. And what does that look like? So I wanted to keep things simple. Uh, so we have three facts and three ways forward, and all we need to do is count to three, so off we go. Um, the first fact is inequality. And Dan spoke about this with the, the mega yacht, but it's not just, you know, Jeff Bezos and a mega yacht with missile defense. I wonder who might be interested in... Anyway. Um, 
the, 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 one of the, this is, these are results from Marta Baltrushevitz, um, the third paper from her PhD, uh, which was taken up by Carbon Brief. And what you can see sort of here is that the purple bar that is very equal among income deciles, so the top is the top income decile, the bottom is the bottom income decile in the UK, is that housing is fairly equally distributed. And the categories of energy footprint that are vastly unequally distributed are transport. It's cars and flights. And so we really see not just that energy inequality exists and is massive, but we also see where it's being consumed that's different. Rich people overconsume, they buy big cars, they fly a lot, and uh, that's basically what they do with their extra money, and we need to stop that. Okay. Um, so how do we change that? So the way forward is sufficiency. The way forward is this social provision. And uh, we heard all about sufficiency from Yamina Saheb this morning. I'm not going to repeat her definition uh, from the IPCC, uh, but I'm going to point out that this picture is an existing place, a housing cooperative in Geneva, where you don't get to see a single car, and it is a beautiful, beautiful place. And these are the kinds of things, these ideas of shared of public frugal, of private frugality and public luxury are, are feasible and desirable, and this is a desirable future that we can, that we can try to bring forward. Um, the second fact is possibility. So what I mean by possibility is that a possible future of well-being for all, of decent living conditions for all, at much lower levels of energy use is possible. So this is based on Narasimha Rao's decent living energy framework, and when we model it, we find that you know we can sort of get to decent living energy based on existing technologies, not made up ones, um, with about half of our current energy use, but not with a heck of a lot of inequality at all. Um, and Yarmo Kickstra's in the audience, there you go. Uh, so the way forward here is investment. So if we want to get to that future, one of the things we need to do is investment. And this is something where I happen to be in agreement with our first speaker. We need massive investment. And this is uh, something that um, uh, Yarmo's paper from 2020 run really shows on the, on the Left-hand side. On the left-hand side, you see the investment energy necessary, so the investment in technology and infrastructure necessary for people to reach this decent living energy. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lot. It's two, 290 exajoules, roughly, which is a good chunk of our annual energy use. But this is over a period of decades um, that we would do this investment. And then once you invest in that, your energy use afterwards is lower. So we really have this, this sort of... Uh, you know, tipping point in our economic system, basically, where we need to invest in a future, we need to invest in sufficiency. Not just efficiency, sufficiency. And a lot of that investment is in the global south, and a lot of that investment is in the dwelling sector. So it's not just about renewable energy, it's about making our living conditions safe and sufficient. Um, the third fact is dependency. So Provisioning systems could enable good lives at low resource use, but are in fact often engineered to the contrary to create resource dependency. So our dependency, the dependency on resource intensive consumption is itself an industrial product. And it is driven by decades, if not centuries in some cases, of lobbying, subsidies, and state and regulatory capture. So what we have to understand is that these provisioning systems could be possibly designed differently, but currently are very much engineered to create resource dependency, and that our governments are very much part of that work. And this is a problem. And here comes my economics lesson based on my artistic skills, and I am so extremely sorry. Um, so the basic neoclassical market idea is that the, the market is the flat surface of the sea, and we're in Belgium, and these ants are carrying buckets of beer. Um, and they're basically, so everybody is a price taker, nobody is a price maker, nobody has control over the market, neither producers or consumers, and everybody is delightfully happy drinking Belgian beer. Um, however, the reality, when we look at the political economy, at the reality of markets, what we see is that it's, a it's a bunch of vertical supply chains that are very much tied together. So here we have uh, oil, roads, cars, and suburban real estate, which is one of the things we studied in our political economy of car dependence. And you see these sort of vertical structures really tied to each other with the state, the state is basically a scaffolding keeping the whole thing up. And uh, the consumers don't have a heck of a lot of choice. So the market be ends up being more of a funnel from those overproducing sectors to um, creating dependency on their product. Um, 
So in this sense, the way forward has to be taking power back. It has to be taking our governments back, our budgets back. Um, and I would say that the way forward here is democracy. So we have to break, to break dependency and state capture requires expanding the scope of democracy to our economies. Right now we have democracies and political system that let the market do its own thing, sort of. And that is extraordinarily dangerous. So we need active economic citizenship through ex and expanded decision making at the level of workers, community members, households, and all different levels of governance. And I think that this, you know, either we succeed or it's not going to go well for us. Um, in fact, we find that democracy is one of the factors that enables well-being at lower resource use. This was a paper by Yefim Fogel, who is also somewhere in the audience. Um, it's a beautiful paper that the, the IPCC also reported on. And we find that negative factors that make it harder to achieve well-being at low resource use include extractivism, so dependency on mining and fossil fuel extraction, for instance, and also economic growth above a moderate income. So there you have it. And that's not because we wanted it to be that way. That just fell out of the data. Um, in the future, uh, we are lucky enough to be working as one of the, one of the major projects that has been funded in this space uh, with Yorgos uh, Kallis and with Jason Hickel. We're going to be looking at this idea of democratizing provisioning systems. We're going to be looking at post-growth models of resource use. And um, I look forward to working with many of you as fast as we can. The hour is late, but maybe we can still try to move things a bit. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And you didn't even hit the limit for time, so you did brilliantly. Thank you. We're going to ask uh, Farhana Sultana to join us next. Uh, Farhana is a professor of geography at Syracuse University and is going to give us a perspective on the global south, uh, which is... Oh, great. There we are. Hello. Thank you very Hi. much. Thank you, um, everyone, for being here, and uh, hello to wherever you may be. Uh, I want to thank uh, the colleagues at the European Parliament for organizing this brilliant set of sessions on the conference and for inviting me to join the panel, and I'm honored to join you, um, albeit from afar. So I, I want to launch into what I want to say in terms of what we know, uh, what economists have provided us, uh, and also provides a slightly different um, analysis here. So as has been discussed here and elsewhere, we know that climate breakdown results from extraction, overproduction, and overconsumption that are unequally and inequitably distributed around the world, largely because of historical factors that produce these systems. The global crossing of planetary boundaries that Johan talked about, however, is not the same everywhere, nor contributed to by everyone, as other co-panelists have pointed out. The unevenness of the outcomes of growth have far-reaching consequences, both in terms of who benefits, where, why, and how. So first of all, the capitalist elite everywhere are over-consuming and leading the charge, you know, in their yachts that Dan showed us. They lead the charge to colonize minds into desirable outcomes, what you should be like, what you should aspire to do. And as a result, that model of hyper-consumption, extractivism, and a discard culture throws away everything that we actually need to sustain ourselves and the planet. These elitists uh, participate in accumulation by dispossession, resulting not only in disproportionate capitalist benefits from resource control and pr promotion of neocolonialist policies, but contribute to ecological harms, biodiversity crises, water pollution, air pollution, and climate breakdown that they don't really experience firsthand every day. So the boundaries that are being crossed are primarily being led by capitalist elites everywhere, but also entire countries of the global north or the high energy industrialized economies, causing disproportionate societal and ecological harms to more marginalized communities often elsewhere. The extraction and discard culture embedded in these processes and economic models continue not just natural resources, exploitation, but also the destruction of human lives and potentials, resulting in a discard for the care economy and ecosystem resilience, and often just lip service to basic welfare of billions 
caught in exploitative and neocolonial labor relations with global capital and extractive resource-based trade that causes irreversible harms. The average citizens, many of you here today, primarily in, based in or from nor, global north countries and increasingly elsewhere, are also all of us are participating in this hyper-consumptive lifestyle and are locked into systems of energy use via infrastructure, transportation, and agricultural modes of production that folks often feel are outside of their direct control. But as Julia has shown us, this is clearly not the case. We can and do have like regulatory changes. We need cultural shifts and policy changes and understand the wider political economy in order to hold climate justice, global societal equity and sufficiency at the heart of what we can foster and change and grow in order to allow systemic and structural shifts that are indeed very much needed. So de-linking growth from well-being has been prom promoted by proponents of degrowth, particularly confronting the endless growth and extractivism models practiced increasingly everywhere, but primarily in powerful and rich countries. These may be challenging to accomplish quickly, but they are not impossible. It is always a question of intent and action and of decision-making power. The worlds we inhabit did not just appear. This is not gravity. It was made to happen through particular formations of colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism of the last few centuries. It is a destructive fossil fuel-based growth paradigm, the bill for which has been paid historically by ecosystems and black and brown communities of the majority world or the global south largely across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Many parts of the majority world that were historically colonized and exploited, the citizens are increasingly being encouraged to aspire to hyperconsumption, whereby material goods and high energy usage have limited the terms of the debate on what well-being can actually be, because a pursuit of ever higher GDP growth rate has been conditioned to be the only model of prosperity. There is obviously no doubt that having sufficient water, food, housing, education, employment and health care are critically essential and just, yet often impossible or insufficient given global maldistribution of resource use and power relations. However, with international development and globalization models and ever increasingly media and pop culture and domestic policies around the world being influenced by international donors and actors and policymakers, more and more countries and communities across the global south are being influenced to be aspirational or to mimic the unsustainable Eurocentric and Western lifestyles and habits of cultures of hyperconsumption and disposal, even even though it has been established that the current models of capitalist development logics cannot continue unabated at all. Such ideologies actually often go against indigenous and local cultures and practices of sufficiency, care, commoning, sustainability and reciprocity, which were and continue to be eroded and devalued. These colonial capitalist renditions of modernity that are often spurring on high energy desires and pursuit of ever higher and destructive GDP, the entire model which was in, established during colonialism and maintained through global policies, trade, imperial forces and so on post-World War II are simply not possible. The speed of mitigation actually that's needed in the global north is not fast enough to change to keep up with the planetary boundary strains. So, so the rest of the world is facing increasing loss and damages in real time as externalities of capitalist growth are ex uh, increasingly externalized and exported to more and more marginalized, marginalized communities and groups of people. At the same time, biophysical resources globally are not always available to everyone spatially and societally in equitable manners to pursue even basic well-being. The colonization of the atmosphere and planetary resources by the powerful skew what is a 
accessible and available to others. The justice implications are naturally extensive and enduring ever since the Industrial Revolution, whereby the unequal ecological exchange of resources from the majority world to the global north resulted in drains of not just resources that are material and economic, but also structured a world economy that continues to rely on exploitation of resources and peoples for marginalized communities as if that is the norm and nothing else is plausible. So scholars have tried to quantify this unequal ecological exchange to demonstrate how destructive it is and that we need to imagine other worlds. They have called it the ongoing colonial plunder of resources from the global south to the global north, one that contributes to overdeveloping the latter at the expense of the former. Such processes continue various colonial patterns of harm and dispossession from the past and into the future, with increasing debt burdens to poorer countries and communities, while there is a funneling up of benefits to a few. These same communities are also the ones at the front lines, facing deeper and longer standing climate breakdown and are rendered multiply vulnerable. As societies extract, produce, transport, consume and dispose at greater quantities and at greater speeds, it is impossible to expect the system to not buckle or shift in unforeseen ways if the same pathway is pursued. The challenges to intergenerational justice must include intragenerational and spatial justice inclusive of accounting of impacts to the global south. Reductions of material and energy throughput is necessary in the global north for climate justice, ecological justice and true decolonization and abol abolition justice in the global south and increasingly everywhere. Thus. Any discussion of moving beyond growth needs to reckon more critically with unequal contributions to the crisis, as well as how we can discursively and materially foster other notions of well-being and prosperity beyond GDP growth and hyperconsumption to more practically and equitably encourage alliances and real solidarities with social movements across the global south, from which lessons can be learned, trialed, unlearned and relearned as feminist, decolonial, anti-colonial, anti-racist and anti-imperial scholars and activists of degrowth, post-growth and post-development have demonstrated, such analyses must also contend with the intersectional impacts and outcomes as well as alternative models of flourishing that exist but are often unheeded or discarded. This includes attention to intersections of gender, race, class, and so on, and the ways in which the epistemologies and praxis of well-being and prosperity prosperity occur on the ground. Such concerns need to be accounted for in any discussion of planetary limits and boundaries, as it's always a question of by whom, for whom, where and where. So in conclusion, addressing going beyond growth necessitates real engagement with Global South, Indigenous and decolonial scholarship, activism and perspectives to be integrated and centered to support revolutionary potentialities as possible pathways for Forward. The crises of climate coloniality and unrealistic growth straining planetary boundaries is one of lack of democracy in economic organization and planning, of institutional policy priorities and geopolitical power relations, but also one of ontological and epistemological shifts at scale that include different visions and models that prioritize futures not based on colonial and imperial utopias of endless capitalist growth on a finite planet, but one that focuses on restoration, reparation, caring, dignity, and flourishing for all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely vital to have that perspective there, bringing us to the global south um, and bringing indigenous people and decolonization to the fore. Thank you for that.
Our final uh, panelist uh, for this session is Aurelien Barou, uh, who's a physicist and philosopher at the University of Grenoble in France. Um, so we're going to get uh, a perspective here that will draw together uh, some of the narratives that we've just heard. Thank you. Monsieur Dombrovskis, effectivement, prétendait que le découplage entre croissance économique et catastrophe écologique est en cours. J'irai encore plus loin que Dan pour le contredire. Je dirais qu'il y a en réalité surcouplage. Et je me permets de parler en français comme une petite provocation contre toutes les hégémonies, y compris celles des langages. Alors, contrairement à ce que la présidente von der Leyen laissait entendre ici même, hier matin, en ouverture de cette réunion, notre problème ne concerne pas principalement, me semble-t-il, l'utilisation des énergies fossiles. Je crois que le consensus chez les informés pourrait se résumer ainsi. Il existe des limites planétaires, nous les dépassons, c'est intenable. Plus encore que le réchauffement climatique, la détérioration de l'intégrité de la biosphère constitue une menace extrême. Notre salut n'est pas compatible avec la poursuite de la croissance. Tout cela est vrai et je le soutiens solennellement. Le nier relève aujourd'hui de la complicité du crime de masse. Pourtant, ces assertions sont aussi dramatiquement insuffisantes, car en dépit de leur consonance presque révolutionnaire, elles constituent encore une vision trop convenue et trop timide, presque étriquée. Alors, en première approximation, oui, ces énoncés sont corrects pour des raisons évidentes. C'est vrai, le réchauffement climatique mène à une situation instable, qui attentent à l'habitabilité de notre planète. Oui, l'acidification des océans, l'interruption des cycles biogéochimiques, l'introduction d'espèces invasives, le, le, la pollution et la chute de la biodiversité menacent également. Oui, ceci est inconciliable avec notre avenir. La crise est profondément systémique. Le délire métastatique de la machine de guerre économico-technologique que nous avons élaborée n'est pas tenable. Si l'on demeure dans les vérités, produites par le cadre paradigmatique du monde prédateur, qui est aussi d'ailleurs le monde suicidaire dans lequel nous nous trouvons, tout cela est bien clair. Les prélèvements ne peuvent durer longtemps et ne peuvent demeurer au-dessus des ressources. Il n'est pas nécessaire de cumuler les doctorats pour le comprendre. Notre manière d'habiter l'espace transforme cette planète en déchets. Elle est inconséquente, irrationnelle et coupable. La question de la post-croissance se pose donc évidemment. Je crois pourtant que ce serait encore manquer de profondeur que d'en demeurer ici. Permettez-moi donc d'énoncer les choses de manière un peu plus provocatrice. Il n'y a aucun problème de croissance, l'effondrement de la biodiversité n'est pas en danger et les limites planétaires sont des bénédictions. Vous l'imaginez, il ne s'agit pas d'une invite à la poursuite du carnage. Je m'explique donc. D'abord, et cela fut rappelé par nombre d'orateurs et d'oratrices. Il n'y a aucun sens à nommer « croissance », ce qui relève d'un déclin de notre puissance d'être. En quoi l'artificialisation globale du réel et l'anéantissement de nos potentialités pourrait-il être considéré comme de la croissance C'est une contradiction dans les termes, ne nous laissons pas voler les mots par les fous. C'est à peu près aussi déraisonnable que d'user du terme d'intelligence artificielle très à la mode pour référer à des algorithmes qui n'ont rien d'intelligent. 
indépendamment des externalités négatives considérables du numérique, la seule question intéressante serait « Tout cela nous rend-il plus heureux et plus alerte ?» Cette technologie qui permettra d'automatiser les recrutements, de marginaliser les artistes, d'uniformiser les attentes, d'atrophier les possibles, de déployer les contrôles et surveillances de masse, d'élaguer les errances, d'autonomiser la finance et de supprimer les imprévus, est-elle un progrès Sans même se soucier de son coût énergétique, de ses conséquences néocoloniales délétères et de son impact sur les vivants non humains, constitue-t-elle en elle-même un dessin désirable Souhaite-t-on obérer le fondement de notre humanité en déléguant nos choix à des processeurs L'interrogation n'est pas de nature scientifique, et je le dis en tant que scientifique. Elle est à la marge de nature politique, mais elle est fondamentalement poétique, axiologique et ontologique. Finalement, c'est d'ailleurs la seule bonne nouvelle. Il n'y aurait aucun effort à faire, puisque ce qui détruit la vie se trouve être également ce qui érode ou efface le sens. La croissance ne pose aucun problème. Décuplons nos amours et nos idées, nos écrits et nos offerts, nos équations et nos symphonies, nos intelligences et nos empathies. Ce qu'on nomme improprement décroissance ne réfère qu'au sortir de nos addictions mortifères. Ce ne serait pas une privation, ce serait une guérison, un désensorcellement. Un exemple plus important peut-être pour contredire cette fois l'autre présidente, Madame Metzola. Imaginez que nous disposions un jour d'une énergie presque propre et presque infinie. Ce serait, je crois, le pire scénario envisageable. Prenons un peu de hauteur et raisonnons au-delà de nos réflexes d'ingénieur pavlovien. Le problème majeur aujourd'hui, j'y insiste, tient à ce que nous faisons de l'énergie, pas à son origine. Tant que la destruction systématique de la vie, la dévastation des fonds marins, l'éradication des forêts demeure notre horizon, et rappelez-vous que ces activités sont nommées « croissance » par les gens sérieux qui siègent dans cet hémicycle, plus d'énergie ne signifie qu'une chose, plus de destruction. Nous n'avons pas commencé à être sérieux, c'est-à-dire à poser la question des fins et pas uniquement celle des moyens. Deuxièmement, je soulignais que la chute de la biodiversité n'était pas une menace, tout simplement parce qu'il s'agit d'une erreur catégorielle. La disparition de la vie sur Terre, comme vous le savez, nous avons déjà éradiqué les deux tiers des populations d'insectes, les deux tiers des populations de mammifères sauvages et les deux tiers des populations d'arbres. Cette disparition ne peut pas être considéré comme un danger pouvant induire une catastrophe. Elle est en tant que telle la catastrophe. Ces métaconfusions rendent toute analyse inopérante. Un peu comme si un médecin considérait la mort du patient comme un symptôme parmi d'autres et non pas précisément l'enjeu précis de ce contre quoi il ou elle travaille. Enfin, et troisièmement, je suggérais que les limites planétaires étaient bienvenues. Parce que créer, vivre, inventer, imaginer, c'est toujours composer avec une frontière. Nous ne sommes pas Dieu. La finitude est notre lot, la beauté s'élabore toujours dans la contrainte. Ce n'est pas triste, c'est être en vie. Et c'est d'ailleurs le sens même du mot « existence ». Ce n'est pas se résigner ou abdiquer que de le saisir. C'est tout à l'inverse choisir de cheminer sans œillère, 
dans un réel plus riche et flamboyant, mais aussi plus fragile que nous l'avions imaginé. Notre insouciance était une délinquance. Notre obstination commence à relever de l'autoterrorisme. Et c'est important de le souligner ici, au Parlement européen. Nous sommes les héritiers et les héritières du Logos, le cœur sublime de la Grèce antique, invention géniale, mais dangereuse, d'une rationalité qui se croit unique, qui se veut universelle et qui se rêve omnipotente. Logos, le joyau et le fléau de l'Occident. Aujourd'hui, Face à la certitude de l'échec, un peu d'humilité serait bienvenue. Abandonner un instant notre suffisance et chercher à apprendre plus qu'à enseigner, en particulier dans nos rapports aux pays du Sud. D'ailleurs, nous avons maintenant la conviction que nos prédécesseurs au néolithique et au paléolithique furent extrêmement explorateurs. Notre spécificité n'est pas de nous fourvoyer, nous ne sommes pas les premiers, mais de nous entêter. Malgré l'évidence scientifique, éthique et esthétique de notre inconséquence, aucune remise en question sérieuse ne semble poindre chez les gens sérieux. Nous sommes c'est un fait. La civilisation la plus meurtrière de tous les temps du point de vue de la biosphère. Nous devenons aussi l'une des plus ineptes et finalement des plus malheureuses. Je crois que la question des modalités, comment continuer à l'identique en émettant un peu moins de CO2, ne devrait plus du tout nous intéresser. La seule question signifiante est celle des finalités. Où voulons-nous aller Un tout autre monde, sevré de nos addictions pernicieuses et de nos prédations nécrophiles, ne relèverait peut-être ni de l'effort ni de la cèse, mais de la jouissance assumée d'une puissance réinvestie. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aurélien, for those very well-received remarks. Excellent. Thank you. Now, you can ask your questions or make your comments using the Slido uh, application now, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so uh, it, while you get yourselves together doing that, uh, I'm going to ask a little question of our panelists here, because um, here we are with a lot of... Uh, support from the Greens here. Not everyone in Europe, or indeed around the world, votes Green. And there are many people who prefer rather populist parties. And when you say things like sufficiency, uh, they hear rationing. When you say limits, they hear limits to my freedom. What would you say to that? I'll take, uh, perhaps you'd like to start, Julia, because you had this idea of sufficiency. Why is that not rationing? Okay, Th thanks, Fiona, and um, uh, it's not my idea. I, I f originality is, a, is not um, a strong suit. Um, so uh, I think, I I'd hate to create uh, take credit for that one. I think that the, um, it's one of the things that we've been discussing as well uh, during the conference, and, it, and it's something that also came up this morning in the, in the energy panel. Um, I think that in order for these ideas of sufficiency and limits and really radical change in directions to take root, um, I think Aurélien is correct. We have to have a change in philosophy. Um, and I, but I think that it, it also has to do with learning um, uh, or exposure, something which The Guardian actually does uh, from time to time quite well, what the trap of overconsumption it consists of. 
So the idea that overconsumption is freedom when it's really being trapped in a car. I mean, um, I, I, I remember looking at OECD data of hours in, in vehicle driving, and the Americans had this, were going up, and the Europeans were going up, and the Americans sort of leveled off, and the Europeans were still going up, and I was wondering why the Americans leveled off. And it's because they were driving as many hours as you can while still needing to sleep and work. <laughs> they eat in their cars. The number of meals eaten in cars in America is huge. We don't even, anyway. So, um, <laughs> so, so I think that one of, one of the things to realize is, is, is that we need to have a, we have a huge communication challenge in terms of exposing overconsumption as lack of freedom, as dependence, as lack of safety, as precarity, as geopolitical risk. And so that's one of the things that we need to do, and we need to do it fast. But I think that once people understand that, you know, you need a car the same way you need to smoke three packs of cigarette a day, um, the things start changing, and that you and that we have the same industrial pressures, really that are quite coercive in terms of pushing that overconsumption. If people can understand that, I think they have quite a different uh, view on this. Thank you. And something else that, that uh, people might ask is, um, if, uh, wouldn't there be more to go around if, uh, if we had fewer people on the planet? Dan, wouldn't there? I, I, th I thought you were going to ask, wouldn't there be more to go around if we limited the incomes of the rich? Um, I, I think th this is an issue. <laughs> Which I was about to say, yes, probably there would be. Um, I think this, this issue sometimes gets dragged out. Um, in, in the 1970s, population growth was, was re regarded as quite a, a serious issue um, to be dealt with. But in many ways, we, we are uh, on the route to stabilizing global population. And a lot of analysis that has been done suggests that overconsumption is a bigger problem than, than growth in population. And we also have quite a a good sense now in, in how to stabilize global population. And it's not by doing a whole bunch of horrible draconian things, it's by doing things like uh, providing equal rights for women and education and things which we want to do anyways, right? So I, I would say that, that ultimately environmental impact is a product of the number of people times how much each of those people consumes. But at the moment, the bigger issue that we're facing is the issue of, of consumption, and that's the one we really need to turn our, our heads to around, uh, our heads towards, because it's the one we're having the bigger difficulty actually addressing. I would say. Thank you. Thank you. We've got an excellent question here on Slido, which is: uh, uh, How can power be taken away from the current ruling elites? And how peacefully can this be done? Aurélien, would you like to take that for us? Je me permets juste un mot sur les questions précédentes, euh, sur les, les limites, euh, sur les limites de la, de la liberté. Je, je discutais un jour avec un des grands responsables de l'aéronautique mondiale qui me disait la main sur le cœur, je veux un monde dans lequel ma fille est libre de prendre l'avion. Je lui ai répondu, mais bien sûr, mais si ta fille est morte, c'est pas très intéressant. Et donc, la question fondamentale n'est pas la liberté versus la contrainte. La question fondamentale est comment concilier des libertés qui sont fondamentalement antagonistes. La liberté de vivre versus la liberté des jouissances futiles. C'est ça, la question sérieuse. De même que pour la démographie, la démographie si vous me permettez d'y revenir, un Elon Musk est plus grave que toute l'Afrique. Donc, ce n'est pas vraiment le nombre de personnes le problème, c'est le rapport au monde. Quant aux moyens pacifiques d'y arriver, je pense que la question est subtile. Personne ne souhaite l'affrontement brutal, et personne moins que moi. Le fait est géopolitique néanmoins qu'il est très difficile de susciter une révolution globale sans qu'un système soit empêché de fonctionner. Il ne suffit pas que des idées soient populaires. Il faut que l'inertie des idées précédentes soit interrompue. La manière de le faire, je l'ignore. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to get this question of uh, decolonisation in uh, as well. We're asked how can the European, how can we get the European Commission to understand this uh, decolonisation issue? Um, would you like to take that, Tan? Frana, sorry. Uh, sure. So how to get the European Commission to decolonize uh, is often a question that is posed by my students. How do we decolonize mindsets and patterns that have created the problem? And I, and I think a lot of it comes from re-education. Uh, a lot of it comes from the how we uh, have colonized minds through education, through ideologies, through policies. So for the European Commission to really take decolonizing um, seriously, first we'd involve a lot of reading, but also listening. You have to listen to communities um, on the ground in the majority world and indigenous communities in settler colonial contexts in terms of what it means to not just set the terms of the debate, uh, you know, have a seat at a table, but to burn the table down, reconstruct something different. That's what decolonizing means. It doesn't mean diversifying, but it really means giving uh, power to different uh, bodies and groups to have decision-making power, to have a say, to act actually do deep listening in order to kind of uncondition your own mind. And that means seeding ground. That means seeding um, political power in certain ways at the global stage. And I understand uh, that just as it was mentioned before me, it is incredibly hard to demand. But I think we can start to see generational shifts. But we're at the same time fighting against much greater push from other sectors, um, whether it's um, corporations, media, fossil fuel industries, in, who are continuing to benefit from the kind of um, colonial capitalist uh, renditions. And, and I think we need to really confront that and a multi-pronged way. But a lot of that is basically having a lot of town halls, open uh, meetings, a deep listening by those in power, um, and in terms of sharing of knowledge from the majority world and from indigenous and black and brown communities, and recognizing that there's not going to be a perfect solution, that this is not some easy utopian future unless you create it to be. And, and I believe that can only come through democratizing um, economic policy making and democratizing knowledge production and knowledge sharing and knowledge consumption. Thank you. Thank you. And Johan, we had a question about uh, mindsets. Uh, how do we change people's mindsets? It seems to me that perhaps we might, many of us might be living in a Holocene mindset, uh, though we've entered the Anthropocene. Um, how would you change mindsets then? I, I think we're in a, a very decisive phase right now. We're living in um, the largest turbulence on Earth since we left the Second World War. We are potentially entering a, a new Cold War, and we are deep, deep into the crisis where we are seeing how the Earth system is sending invoices back across the entire world. Very few people recognize that ground zero on, on changes on Earth today is, is in Europe in terms of frequency of forest fires, heat waves, droughts. And this is changing the mindset. I see a, a shift here where global sustainability or sustainability in general, even though we are in the early days and it's going too slowly, is, is now becoming increasingly the entry point for what we mean by welfare or prosperity or success. And not enough on equity, for sure, but we are increasingly seeing that sustainability is shifting um, the whole narrative is shifting from being an environmental issue about how to, uh, uh, what's the willingness to pay for protecting the environment and how far should we push away humans from protecting and conserving nature, which is the old paradigm, today to being much more an issue of, of custodianship or stewardship and even businesses, particularly across Europe, seeing the pathway towards um, better performance and, and more attraction of uh, young talent being aligning with sustainability. So I'm actually, this is one of the few lights in the tunnel that I see how sustainability is changing from, from being an environmental crisis issue only to being a pathway towards a more modern, responsible future. The challenge is, has been very, very clear in this panel that we are 
too slow and we're not shifting the gear fast enough. But, but I think that's where we want to move towards a narrative where sustainability is the path towards a responsible, successful and equitable future. And you had mentioned business there. And we've got a, a very good question, which is that uh, one of the uh, obstacles to uh, people understanding this is the lobbying from businesses. So how can we stop some of that lobbying? Who'd like to, to take this on? This will be one of our final questions because we're coming to the end of our time. Julia. Um, I think we need researchers, and there's tons of them around, to take lobbying as an object of research. So I think that this is something that um, it's always a bit, un, you know, I don't know why, but it's something that's very much under-researched is the workings of power in this way. A lot of the lobbying in this, in this space is done in plain sight. We have ExxonMobil that has lobbying access in the European Union and that has access to parliamentary members and that communicates with them. And we have, we have ways of understanding what is said, by whom, when, and exposing it. So I think that a lot of um, a light can be shone can be shown on by research and by journalists on the workings of lobbying and exposing it. So, there, you know, it's true that there's no disinfectant like sunlight, and we need a lot more sunlight on uh, these processes, a lot more exposure. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we're nearly at the end of our time. I'm going to squeeze in one final question because I think it's a really good one. Uh, I'm afraid the Commissioner is no longer with us. So one of our panellists uh, here who would like to dive for this one. It's a great one. How can we get the European Commission to understand that degrowth is something different from green growth? Who'd like to take that on for us here? Bon. Euh, je crois qu'il est temps d'être un peu sérieux. Euh, on ne peut plus continuer à donner l'illusion que le débat contradictoire représente la neutralité. Le débat contradictoire n'est pas neutre. Dans mon domaine, en astrophysique, je ne vais pas inviter quelqu'un qui pense que la Terre est plate et quelqu'un qui pense que la Terre est ronde. Donner un temps de parole égal aux platistes et aux scientifiques relève de l'imposture. Il suffit que nos dirigeants se renseignent. Well, that was the final word on that subject. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. That's the end of our panel today. Thank you to the Executive Vice President of the Commission earlier for his remarks. Thank you very much to our organisers. But mostly thank you all for being here. And there's another day of this uh, excellent Beyond Growth conference here tomorrow. So look forward to seeing you all again then. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.